Thank you. Thank you very much. Perspective on the changing world of the Americas, 36 countries, excluding the colonies. I'm only surprised there's still so many colonies in Latin America. Anyway, you said 20 minutes, so that's about 100 words per minute. So let's just go. I'll dispense with the usual politeness. Kim knows how rude I am, so I won't even say thank you to him. Uh, I'll start with a, a, a remark uh, to the effect that uh, there, there are many expert publications on Latin America and great expert, but the region as a whole attracts little attention. Like foreign affairs, you've got one or two articles every uh, six months or something like that. There's a kind of taking it for granted, which is annoying, despite you know the significance of the history, all the events, the crisis, and the profound interest uh, accruing to the region. So given the emphasis that we had on, on China and all that, let me start with the facts and only the facts. One figure, China is in the process of investing $500 billion in Latin America over the next 10 years. That's half a trillion dollars. That's belt and roads on steroids. So that's the picture for starters. Now, I know we tend to focus on President Trump. I don't know whether it's rude or impolite to just say Trump. So I don't know whether I should say Donald Trump, President Trump, the President of the United States. Anyway, we'll discuss that at the end. Um, Donald Trump is a kind of alternative reality, and yet he's quite real and, in my view, profoundly damaging, as despite the US still being the most formidable power on Earth, he looks like having ceded a chunk of initiative in Latin America and elsewhere to both Russia and even more so to China. That's my half trillion. In a way, the real reality is elsewhere. So while for the Americas, uh, tr Donald Trump matters a lot, the problem is that there doesn't seem to be an American policy towards the region, unless, of course, imposing tariff is considered the ultimate trait of genius. Lack of a clear policy, and I don't, I'm not, don't contradict the previous speakers, but I really think it sounds familiar, the lack of, of, of a clear policy. And on the other side, you've got China that has a policy for and in the region. First of all, through its investment, it tries to wean away out of the 10 countries in the region, Central America and Caribbean, from maintaining their diplomatic relation with Taiwan. It may sound trite, but for them it's critically important. It tries to counter the appeal and potential influence of a US absent TPP in the region. And China has become a pivotal partner for Latin American countries, trade over the past uh, what, uh, 10 to 270 billion in the past 12 years. <laughs> and even when trade is not significant, with some of the region countries, of course, such as Central America, China's investment are dictated by a much more precise appreciation of its geopolitical importance and significance. China is the second biggest user of the Panama Canal. And so, in a way, facing, if I may call it, the vagaries and commercial threat on the US side, Chinese leaders are actually increasingly effective in portraying China as a reliable partner while partly hiding its ruthlessness. And to ensure the success of the pain job that China is doing, it cajoles or coerces its own diaspora, something that we've noticed also in Canada. What all this means is that a, despite a deeply repressive regime and authoritarian control on what could be called a semi-capitalist uh, economy, China today is the country that seems to be embracing free trade, multilateralism, and globalization. And I joined Professor Dresden on that score. But clearly, the embrace plays out under different terms than the founder of the original model after World War II. The real security danger for the region, as elsewhere in the world, is for countries to become so indebted to China that they will have limited option, but to increasingly cave in, into its demands. Its approach emerged from, the Chinese approach that is, emerged from the disillusion uh, of the 2008 financial crisis. I don't know if you're aware that China is, a, is the country that actually lost more than any other country during the 2008 crisis. We saw it from the Western eyes, but actually China lost a lot. And that country had many countries in the world, that uh, crisis had many countries in the world questioning the value of the model, 
and moving towards a more dirigist, state-run, quote, free market, unquote, economy, and authoritarian political system. That applies to Latin America as it applies to the Duterte and to the Erdogan and others of the world. And the fact that it happens, this evolution is happening in the US backyard, underpins the gravity of the change and may signal an irreversible trend. We all know, and sometimes care officially to admit, that the world's gravity is definitely turning towards the Indo-Pacific region. But Donald Trump, in my view, in contradiction maybe with Professor Dresner, is definitely hastening the process in destroying the foundation of the post-world multilateral system, collective defense, and free trade regime. China plays the long game and can only benefit from what may be a point of no return in the weakening of the international liberal order. Russia, for its part, as a second tier player, as in Venezuela, sees any opportunity to fill the voids under Put Putin's tactical genius, but strategic failings. We could talk about Russia at great length. The return to the right in Latin America in and of itself would not be a calamity. I'm not a leftist by definition, I hope. If it was not accompanied by a reduction of the democratic fiber, which uh, Freedom House was celebrating a number of years ago. Freedom House, I think they're crying every day. The rise in instability in Latin America is tied to several factors or trends as social ills accumulate, including leadership failings, Maduro is only one of them, institutional and governance crisis throughout many regions of the region. Again, Nicaragua is not a lone ranger. A failure to address economic inequalities despite increased raw growth figures. And I think we focus too much on the Raw, the raw growth figures. I think the latter is key because Latin America is the one that is the slowest in developing on, on the societal so, 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 uh, level. Alicia Bracena, who is the ECLAC executive secretary, I think put it very squarely, and that's a very good quote, I think, from her. The Latin America and Caribbean region has not yet adopted an agenda of social transformation that favors the change from a culture of privilege to an environment in which equal rights enable a sense of ownership in a more integrated society. Now, populism in uh, um, the Americas is not a new phenomenon, but when the president of Brazil calls on the armored forces to commemorate the coup that installed a brutal military dictatorship years ago, it sends a pretty chilling message about the evolution of values in the continent. Latin America is thus not much different from other regions in the world where illiberalism is growing. So democracy is at a turning point everywhere. Political systems appear less and less capable of meeting the demands of rapidly changing societies, leaving behind large swaths of the population and allowing corruption to become systemic. And that was a Professor Dresner recognition that are the flaws of our analysis of globalization. So existing institutional framework in the face of heightened anxieties have tended to both deepen division and stifle initiative. So that's a picture, but then what about Mr. Trump in the region? I did write Trump only, but Mr. Trump in the region. So other than the renegotiation of NAFTA, which was superbly managed by Canada, given the odds, our own prime minister has discovered loneliness with the lack of allied support on the Saudi crisis and Trump's indifference for the impact on Canada from his politicization of the arrest of Huawei Meng, Madame Meng, her, the chief financial officer and daughter of the CEO of uh, Huawei. And if you look at Canada, Canada with US support can make things happen. Even when it does not have that support, as for the Landmine Street here of some years ago, its multilateral partners would bring us to the finish line. Those days are gone, as the US either attacks or ignores most international organizations that were the bedrock of the international system on which Canada relies so much. And Trump's attack on Prime Minister Trudeau on the way out from the G7 will remain a scar for long. I think for Canada and the Canadian Prime Minister, this was the moment of graduating.
finding yourself alone on the on the on the hemisphere and beyond. And we we know we know this because Mrs. Freeland, our foreign minister, was very clear. And I quote, to rely solely on the US security umbrella would make us a client state. Yet, the problem we have in Canada is that we have failed to articulate a national security strategy or a clear-eyed foreign policy. We do have a defense policy review, but it sits in the air because it is not undertoned by a foreign policy or national security policy. Feminism is great, but it is not a substitute to a clear-eyed foreign policy. As to Latin America, other than at the G20 meeting in Argentina, Trump has not visited the region and opted, as we know, to send his vice president at the summit of the Americas. It signals, in my view, contempt and a lack of interest. And in Latin America, it's not just Trump. In Latin America, the United States is seen as an inevitable partner, as an ally of uncertain reliability, and above all, as an irascible giant whose unilateral decisions are taken with little consideration for the interest of Latin Americans. This perception, of course, has strengthened since the accession of Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States. Indeed, Mr. Trump's standing in the region is very low, and his re decision to cut off or reduce aid to Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala has increased the dip. Forget the equal partnership and the overture to Cuba preferred by Obama. While the Canada-US-Mexico agreement called UXMA in the, in the US has been signed, it is far from being ratified. We've seen, and thanks God it's over, but Trump's um, uh, attempt to impose tar tariff on Mexico to prevent migrants from coming to the US, even though it's resolved, it remains, in my view, a totally amazing uh, moment of blackmail. The problem is that in Latin America, it only confirmed that the US is seen increasingly have, as having abando abandoned its uh, moral leadership of the world, and that it cannot even be trusted even when pacta sunt servanda, when you have agreements. So the rule of law is taking a beating, and a new form of international lawlessness could be the next paradigm, with possibly the punting of implementing international law decision under the weight of outside influence, a la Duterte, when, uh, by the law of the sea uh, in, in the South China Sea, but also elsewhere in the world of diplomacy and law. More worrisome is the demise of diplomacy and the reliance on military threat as a preferred tool of influence. Threatening Venezuela is but one example. So the Pentagon seems to have become a kind of alternative to the UN with the US remaining stuck in forever wars. Why should we worry? Well, as Professor Dresner just said, foreign policy in the US has always been the last preserve of bipartisanship, precisely tied to the international liberal order. Those days are over. The US is abandoning treaties that were part of that order, INF, for instance, the International Nuclear Force. All that is happening at a time when the US economy on a PPP basis is no longer the supreme power. While the US continues to have the most powerful military in the world, the president's embrace of Putin and other dictators has blinded him to the external threats, which are the weapons of the future. Russian and Chinese asymmetric capabilities are some of the instruments which, which could eventually alter the foundation on which the organization of the American state was conceived. Yet, the more the US is weakened, the more it should privilege the Americas. But there is another question, looming larger and larger, as the very legitimacy of the existing yet fading international liberal order is under attack. We, whoever we are, try to defend it. But is it seen, is it seen as worth saving nowadays in the capital of the world that are not part of the old Atlantic world? Does it matter in Brazil, in Buenos Aires, in Bogota, in Lima, in Quito, and even Santiago? Is it a priority when the leader of the free world, of the indispensable power, the president presiding over the slow obliteration of the American century when that one doesn't care? In that formula, Chinese assistants look very good. Did you want it darker, as Leonard Cohen said? 